Hello, my name is Kevin Bozick, and I'd like to speak with you about a revolution that is occurring in healthcare today. This is an exciting time to practice medicine. Our ability to diagnose and treat human illness exceeds even the wildest expectations of most of us when we began our careers. At the same time, it's an incredibly challenging time to practice medicine. Unsustainable growth in healthcare costs and variation in quality have made providing efficient, effective health care unachievable in many settings. There are many reasons for this. We have a system that emphasizes care over health. In fact, it's difficult to create a sustainable business model that's focused on improving and maintaining the health of the population. Most patients and providers equate more care with better health despite evidence to the contrary. We have an incredibly fragmented payment and delivery system. Not a day goes by where I don't repeat an imaging study or a lab test that was performed on the same patient within the last week simply because of the lack of interoperability of our increasingly complex health information systems. We have a culture of defensive medicine where clinicians are incentivized to overutilize expensive and often unnecessary tests in order to avoid the risk of missing rare and unlikely causes of illness or injury. We have a medical arms race where we live by the mantra, newer is better, and physicians and hospitals are constantly trying to outdo one another by introducing newer and more expensive treatment options, often before they're proven to be effective, and in some cases, even subjecting patients to unnecessary harm. And finally, we have a moral hazard problem where the people who are making decisions about care, namely physicians and their patients, are completely disconnected from the cost of providing that care. But I'd like to ask you to consider for the purposes of this discussion that the primary driver of dysfunction in the U.S. healthcare system today is the lack of competition based on value. By that I mean the financial success of the system participants, whether you're a physician, a hospital, an insurer, or a supplier of medical devices or pharmaceuticals is completely disconnected from the success of the patient. You may be able to cite instances where that correlation exists, but I can assure you they are completely arbitrary and unintended. That's simply not how the system was designed. The primary goal of all healthcare stakeholders should be to deliver value to patients, where value is defined as patient centered health outcomes achieved per healthcare dollar expended. In order to achieve that goal, several very basic changes need to occur. First, we need to empower all stakeholders with better information about both the cost and quality of care. And that information needs to be available in real time, at the point of service, in an easy to understand, actionable, and appropriately risk adjusted format. Next, we need to reorganize the payment and delivery system around patient centered value, not volume, which will mean increased accountability for both patients and providers. And finally, and most importantly, we need strong leadership from the profession. With respect to the information that patients and providers need to improve value, it starts with understanding how care is delivered to patients, including when, by whom, and how over the entire continuum of care. This can be accomplished with simple patient shadowing techniques or inexpensive, readily accessible technologies such as RFID. Next, we need to understand the actual costs of delivering that care by measuring the resources consumed across the cycle of care using time-driven activity-based costing or similar methodologies. We need to explicitly measure the outcomes associated with the care that we deliver to every patient during and after every interaction with the healthcare system. In orthopedic surgery, the most important outcomes to our patients are pain and function. Yet less than 1% of orthopedic surgeons measure pain and function 
in a systematic fashion using validated tools such as patient reported outcomes. It's time that patient reported outcomes move beyond their use as research tools to achieve their full potential as a practical tool that can be used in daily practice for clinical decision making. I often get asked, why do we need to measure outcomes? After all, it's never been part of our workflow and it's not even required for payment, at least up until now. The simplest way to explain why we need to measure outcomes is through an example. I play golf. I'm not very good, but I keep score. Why? Not so that I can prove that I'm a better golfer than Jordan Spieth, but so that I can get better. If I don't keep track of my outcomes in an honest, objective way, counting every stroke, I'll never have the chance to improve my game. After all, John Wooden once said, if I'm through learning, I'm through. If we're only measuring things that we have mastered, we should stop measuring them and focus on things where we have the opportunity to improve. In addition to better information, we need to reorganize the delivery system to focus on the goal of achieving better health for the patients we treat. In orthopedics, that means moving beyond being good technicians, which is important, to comprehensively managing the full spectrum of disease for the conditions and injuries we treat. In today's delivery system, patients are left to navigate their own care, which can be frustrating to say the least, but is also inefficient and expensive and leads to lost time in diagnosis and treatment and in certain cases, unnecessary and duplicative care. Instead, we need to reorganize care around the conditions we treat, such as arthritis, where we bring together all of the providers who are involved in the care of a patient's illness. In other words, we need to bring the care to the patient rather than the patient to the care. As we reorganize care, we need to think about what Clayton Christensen has referred to in his work as downstreaming care, where everyone on the team is functioning at the top of their license. This means being willing to let go of certain aspects of our jobs that can be done less expensively and in some cases more effectively by lesser trained members of our team. This means letting nurse practitioners and physician assistants and even complementary care providers doing jobs that physicians once did. Nurses doing jobs that nurse practitioners and physician assistants once did. And medical assistants should be doing jobs that nurses once did. In addition to delivering greater value to patients, downstreaming care can lead to a more productive and rewarding environment for all of us to practice. We can't improve value without engaging the patients we treat as active members of the care delivery team. The first step in doing that is to measure patient activation, which is a simple measure of a patient's propensity to engage in positive health behavior. Research by our group and others has demonstrated that patients who are more engaged in positive health behavior have better functional outcomes and less pain following orthopedic interventions. It's important for us to consider the role of the payment system in creating value in healthcare. The current fee-for-service system has been blamed for incentivizing overutilization of diagnostic and therapeutic services. Similarly, capitated payment systems have been criticized for incentivizing undertreatment of patients and withholding care, which in some cases could be both necessary and valuable. The ideal value-based payment system would incentivize the right care for the right patient at the right time focused on optimizing the health of the patients we treat. Value-based payment models are built on the simple premise of eliminating non-value-added care. Going back to our earlier discussion on mapping the process, costs, and outcomes associated with care, this means eliminating all steps in the care delivery cycle that do not enhance value, such as unnecessary care, inappropriate variation, in the way we deliver care across providers, avoidable complications, readmissions, and reoperations, and excess cost due to variation in the price of inputs to care. 
When entering into a value-based payment model, it's important for us as providers to assess and determine which part of the care episode we want to accept risk for. The inpatient care, the inpatient plus post-acute care, or the entire episode of care beginning with the diagnosis of disease through the evaluation and treatment. You make this decision by identifying opportunities to eliminate non-value added care and understand where your levers of control are to influence those care processes. Finally, value-based payment methodologies will not in and of themselves create value unless we actually change the way care is delivered to eliminate waste and inefficiency. This is not an accounting exercise, but an exercise in care redesign masked as a payment incentive. What's missing from the most commonly employed value-based payment methodologies today, which are procedurally based bundled payments, is appropriateness. The most successful procedure that is done flawlessly with efficient resource use and no complications on a patient with limited disease or inappropriate indications for surgery in the first place does not create value. Future bundle payments will need to be centered around the management of conditions such as arthritis rather than procedures such as total joint replacement. It's important to remember that value is agnostic to practice setting. I've seen many examples from a variety of different practice settings around the country that are equipped for success in the area of value-based payment because their singular focus is on delivering the best outcome to their patients at the lowest cost. So in summary, we have a simple choice in front of us as we face the challenges that lie ahead. Either we find ways to stretch our healthcare dollars by improving value, or we simply take our lumps and cost containment will be imposed on all of us by limiting access and cutting provider reimbursement. Sir William Osler said this better than I can when he said medical care must be provided with the utmost efficiency. To do less is a disservice to those we treat and an injustice to those we might have treated. So are you ready for value-based health care? The first and most important question to ask yourself is do you have a laser focus on achieving sustainable, patient-centric value creation with every strategic decision you make? In order to do that, you need credible data on both costs and outcomes. You need well-defined goals and performance metrics. And finally, we need strong leadership from the profession. Thank you for your attention.